Dr. Brees, myself, to go back with Bill, I think, seven or eight years. Uh, his first venture in Dallas was, his idea was to create a rural model that would replicate the work that he was doing in, in Pittsburgh. I would recommend that if you haven't done so already, Google Manchester, your uh, field, uh, Google William Strickland, and you will see the makings of uh, he has rebuilt, in some areas, Pittsburgh from the ashes, literally, uh, from the 60s and 70s. Uh, he's now taken his program on a nation, and, and now it's international, because I understand he's also going to start big down for tonight. This is an incredible man. We're very, very fortunate to hear his story. I hope that as a community we can come together and bring together the, the resources so that we can provide what culture and art do. It uh, transforms. It uh, uplifts and renews the soul like very few things that humanity can muster to do so. And I think Bill is, 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 is the premier exponent of that kind of philosophy. So with, with a lot of uh, humility and honor, uh, we wanted to introduce Bill Strickland. Thank you.
about poor people big time. Just because you're born poor does not mean you have to stay that way. And I'm a big believer in environment. Beautiful environments create beautiful kids. Prisons create prisoners. So based on that assumption, I took over something called the Bidwell Training Center in 1972 with an old, funky poverty program. And the guys who built it stole all the money, and they were looking for somebody to take it over. And back then, I thought, everybody said, well, Bill Strickland, he thinks he's Moses. He'd probably take the job. And back then, I actually did think I was Moses. I <laughs> like all the port of the promised land and all that. So I took over Bidwell in a warehouse with holes in the floor and holes in the roof. And the kids were on their knees gambling the first day I showed up at the job. The front door was hanging on one hinge. There were no windows in the place because the guys had ripped them up because they were breaking in and stealing tankers. <coughs> so I took over Bidwell in that mess. $300,000 was owed to the Internal Revenue Service because the guys who ran it before me stole all the money, which they didn't mention during my job interview. So I had to raise $300,000, which I did, and I paid off the IRS. And I said, well, there's nothing wrong with the kids. Suppose what's wrong with the way we're treating these kids. And that's where the ticket is. That's the answer. The kids turned this into a project. This is what we built in Grand Rapids. The guy who built it called me four years ago from the Anderson Cancer Center. He says, I don't think I'm coming home. But I want you to remember me, just in case I don't make it. And he didn't. Uh, for the two things I was proud of stuff in my life, my family and the center I built in Grand Rapids for people who had no hope. Now, it's one thing for me to stand up here talking about the poor folks, but I think I've got a few years left. It's another when you're down in your last three weeks. That's called evidence. This is what Jim did. That's the space. This is how you're supposed to treat your children. Those are photographs of Dr. King taken during the last two years of his life until he was assassinated. That's the dining facility for the kids. For the kids. This is the gallery for the kids. Cut the drop by rate in Grand Rapids to five percent. These used to be called welfare mothers. They're now called pharmaceutical technicians. <laughs> <laughs> uh, last year we had a wait list too deep. These kids. We saw kids get off the bus for the first time and walk away from the center. And they thought they got off at the wrong stop. They couldn't comprehend that something that beautiful was for them. That's how upside down we've gotten in this country. Children don't even know what it feels like to be treated with dignity. Those kids. That guy got recorded with Alicia Keys. I said, all I want out of this program was lunch with Alicia Keys. And I'm cool for the rest of this life. <laughs> These are the adult kids. These are our first medical tech group. Saturday, I was in Cleveland. These guys just graduated. I was at the first graduation last Saturday. A hundred percent of the students passed the National Pharmacy exam on their first day. Wow. <laughs> this, we just opened New Haven. That's New Haven. It looks exactly like that, by the way. They've been open 30 days. They have a waiting list. 200 applications for 15 pharmacy slots. Just in case you don't think there's a need out there, there's a need everywhere. And Boston is being considered, these three guys. Atlanta is moving forward, Austin, Richmond, Chicago, and U.S. Virgin Islands. All have got groups formed now that are planning on building centers. I predict that Atlanta will be open next year. Uh, Richmond, Virginia, Chicago, all of them. They're all moving forward. And uh, Reno, St. Petersburg, and Allentown, and they've talked about, since I did this slide, add two more cities uh, that have stepped up. And I'm not out looking for work. These are guys who have heard about this stuff. They've come to Pittsburgh and ready to sign up. And uh, we have actually four in Nashville, Vancouver and Northern Israel, 
We had Jews and Arabs meeting in northern Israel uh, in Akko to build a center for the kids. I've been to Israel twice with this slide here. And last time I was there, I was sitting at this table with Jews on one side and Arabs on the other. And there was this Arab guy with one of the trap can things on. And he was kind of looking at me like, you want to cut my throat, man. So I keep talking and I'm watching this guy. And at the end of the presentation, he takes out these beads and throws them on the table. And I turn to the interpreter and said, what are these beads? He said, oh, well, every Muslim is required to go on the Hajj to Mecca at least once during their lifetime to the Holy Land, for which they have a set of beads that commemorate their lifetime journey. He's giving you his beads. He says you're a true believer. Wow. That was an interesting moment. Wow. And I just received a big award in Pittsburgh called the Pursuer Peace Award. And wrote a show, Temple. 700 people showed up who raised a quarter of a million dollars to start planning the center in Israel. And the Arab, Falili Muhammad, came to Pittsburgh to stand in the Jewish synagogue with our chairman of the Jewish, side by side, to celebrate a black guy who wins the Peace Award to go to the center in Israel. That's how this stuff can work if you get it done. Right. The bill was trying to get passed in Congress to fund these things all over the city. We have bipartisan support so far, and in Congress every other week, every other month, we push through the bill. We may make it. And then finally, they got a book out that tells this whole story called Make the Impossible Possible. Books look pretty good. And uh, kids are using it now for their leadership classes at the top business schools Haas, Harvard, Stanford. Kellogg, Amos Tuck, Oxford University in England. I've talked to all these business schools. And uh, it's worked out fine. So that's the story, guys. The reason I came here, these people were friends of mine. And they said that we think we may be ready to take another bite at this thing and see if we can get a frame bill. It may be possible. But if you decide to go down that path, there are a couple things you need to understand. We're not building a poverty program. Forget it. Mm. I have no interest in building a poverty program. If you can't raise the money to do this right, leave these kids alone. <coughs> They'd be better off the way they are than for you to raise their expectations and disappoint them. Mm -hmm. Two, um, it's got to be your center, not my center. I don't live in this I live in this world. You guys have got to come together as a community on behalf of your <coughs> children. So I'm advancing a new concept for nonprofits. It's called cooperation. <laughs> it's very unfamiliar in our industry. You know, y'all learned about what the, the other guy got. Why don't we start pooling these resources and raising the tide for all the boats, man? That's what the real deal is. They're not poor people to go around for everybody. <laughs> you know, got to walk on the market. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I come out here last night and climbed back on a red eye for entertainment. Mm. I came out here to get something. So I'm hoping that I can drill into your brain at least something that looks like a possibility. You can start with one ring. It doesn't have to be Pittsburgh. That took 30 years ago. Someday you can build that. But you can build a world class environment in one room. Mm. But it's got to be done right. And we will stick around for four or five years to help you through that process. So why don't we stop right there and you have a question or two that we can try to answer. Anybody got a question? Yes, sir. I got something to say. <laughs> um, being a young black man, uh, what I just heard is a very inspirational thing. Uh, me and my wife, we have a recent school tour. Uh, we build, we go around and we speak to the kids, and we give away um, SeaWorld tickets, um, Disneyland tickets for kids that graduate with G high GPAs. And you're right, they don't understand when people are giving stuff to them. But uh, I really respect what you came out here and did, and being from Memphis, you know, uh, going, going up in the ghetto, you know, and moving out here and going through Colombia. Um, you're right, they need a lot of this, they need somebody. Good, thank you. We're talking to St. Jude's Hospital 
about uh, doing a, a partnership with those kind of as it turned out last month. I was there two months ago. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Do you have child care centers as well for all these no. loans? I thought about that. It was a great idea. In fact, we had one planted to that the new the building I showed you. So I got to the insurance company. <laughs> and the insurance adjuster said, well, tell us about your experience running child care centers, uh, which we had done. Uh, has anybody got a license? No. They said, do you have any idea what would happen to you if there was an accident with one of these children? They would take your dream and hand it to you on a plate, man. What we recommend is you go find somebody that knows what to do with that has a license in a daycare business and solve the problem. So the kids, the mothers drop off the kids at the daycare center up the street and then come to school. But it, it didn't last for about 10 minutes, so that was cool. Anyway. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, well, one of the, yes, maybe one more. Yeah. Um, well, you, um, it was, that was a great presentation. Everything you just said right now basically it was like our business plan that we presented. Like, that we presented. And that was like everything that we want to do. So it was like, what was, what's the next step? As far as like getting things started, I know you said like get a building, get that started, but like what are the big key things that we need to get started? Well, Debbie and Amanda will help you through that part of the process. We don't have time to get into that now, but the idea is that I want to at least put the pictures in your heads so you at least have some idea of what's possible. And then we'll des designate a group of leaders from this community to begin that dialogue. You have to have a small group. You can't. Democracy is cool, but not to go sense. You know, you got to get three or four or five people to get focused on this thing. You can't run it by committee. So you have to end up calling, doing something that's very important for you to do. It's called trust each other. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, and I think you can do some good. Maybe the city council? Yes. I just want to thank you for coming and giving oh, sure. your, your time and inspiring us very good. with these Like passion is. And at this time, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Uh, Whitaker to escort up Mr. William Bill Strickland. So in a moment, uh, uh, I'm asked Dr. Pickard to say a few words too. Uh, she was at a, a meeting where uh, Mr. Strickland was kind enough to come and share some information with us. A little background, uh, Mr. Strickland is a community leader, author, and the president and CEO of a nonprofit Manchester Bidwell Corporation built based in Pittsburgh. How's the weather been for you? Uh, okay. <laughs> the company subsidiary, subsidiaries, the Manchester Craftsman Guild, and Bidwell Training Center worked with disadvantaged and at use for at youth at risk youth through involvement with the arts and they provide job training for adults, respectively. This was frequently as a winner of a MacArthur Genius Award and the 2011 Voices Award. He has served on the boards of the National Endowment for the Arts, the Mellon Financial Corporation, and the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, Mr. Strickland, we are truly honored to have you here this evening. Uh, we wanted to make sure provide you a little something to remember your, your visit with and we look forward to a continued relationship and I think uh, Dr. Pickett would like to share just a few words. I, I also would like uh, Councilwoman Ramirez to say something as well. We both are on the committee, the Arts and Cultural Committee, that we've been working on for the last year and we're very proud to say that we finally made some awards to some of our local artists today and it was very exciting. If you weren't there and you know someone who was, they were very excited about the fact that we gave out awards and Mr. Strickland was an added uh, enhancement to that activity today. He shared with us what you can do with young people at risk or youngsters who needed an uplift from the community and what a community can do to turn them around, be it at school, at home, 
are at play. And so we were really impressed by what you had to say and what you've done in uh, Pittsburgh, where he is a resident and has never moved, and I won't say for how many years, but he's rebuilt that community with what he's done in terms of showing them that you can live a first-class life no matter what your situation is.